Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Craig Hill from uh, the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering from the University of Minnesota at Duluth. Uh, Craig received his PhD uh, here at the University of Minnesota in Civil Engineering and Water Resources. Uh, worked at the San Anthony Falls Lab for a number of years and graduated in 2015. He specializes in sort of near shore marine environments. As you can see here, he spent uh, quite a bit of time on Lake Superior working uh, with the Blue Heron. And it's going to be exciting to hear about uh, these new sensors he's been working on. So today he's going to talk about developing low cost marine observation systems, challenges for the Great Lakes, and potential blue economic opportunities. So thank you, Craig. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it, I, I feel like I've come full circle um, being back here, not only because I graduated from the Twin Cities campus a few years ago, but uh, back in the 90s when I was in kindergarten and first grade, my mom actually did a master's degree in plant pathology. I don't remember if it was the same building here, but I remember running around the soybean fields and probably ruining her experiments when I was a kindergartner. So um, yeah, it's it's fun to be back. You know, I always love coming down here. It's easy to come down here from Duluth, only two hours away. Uh, hopefully many of you get a chance to come up and explore Duluth or the North Shore if you haven't already done so. Um, but yeah, so today, uh, like Tim said, I'm going to talk about some of the work we're doing up at UMD. Um, I feel very lucky to be able to structure the work that I want to do around using Lake Superior as a field lab. Um, this, of course, is a picture of our RV Blue Heron, the research vessel Blue Heron. It's an incredibly unique facility that we have access to in Duluth. Um, it spends nearly all summer on cruises, research cruises around the Great Lakes, and we get an opportunity to take classes out, um, use it for our research programs if we have a need for it. Um, most of the time, we get fairly good weather out there, but I've definitely seen a lot of seasick students um, out on day trips on Blue Heron. So let's see here. Um, there we go. Uh, yeah, just a little bit background around about me. Um, I'm in mechanical engineering now, but I really have a strong tie to the earth sciences. I think probably you know a lot of the similarities of the research that goes on here in this department as well. My background's in geology, which gradually I was interested in research, uh, river processes, which moved me over into civil engineering and water resources. I spent a number of years working on the engineering staff at SAFL, the St. Anthony Falls Lab, uh, before going back to grad school at the Twin Cities campus, and then moved out to Seattle for a few years, uh, where I was at the University of Washington, uh, part of what is called PMEC, the Pacific Marine Energy Center. My PhD work was on the interactions between marine renewable energy technologies and the environment, and how do they impact the environment, and how does the environment impact their performance and how do we consider that in their optim optimization strategies? Um, I left academia for a couple of years. If anybody's a paddler, I was a, a design engineer for a paddle company, Werner Paddles, which is based outside of Seattle for a couple of years before coming back home to Duluth, Minnesota at, at UMD. Um, and really I've tried to structure the work that I do around water and around using Lake Superior. Um, two core areas that my work has really focused on is still continuing in on marine energy technologies and what's called the blue economy. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, uh, but also getting students engaged in thinking about how can we design multi-sensored systems for the marine environment. Um, some of this work, you'll, you know, it, it might be a little different than some of your past seminars in this department, but hopefully you see some crossovers between this marine observation work and you know, some of the research that you all are involved in. Really what I'm trying to engage our students in at UMD is, you know, how can we focus on these low cost observation systems? How can we use them to make measurements more accessible? Um, can we have denser arrays of sensors out in our environment? Can we extend our observation seasons? Um, and how by doing so, does it build our understanding of how the wave climate's changing in the Great Lakes as we're seeing less and less ice cover. How might the Great Lakes be used to contribute to this emerging industry of marine energy or the blue economy? Um, you know, if you come north 
in November, we're, we're starting to get into this period, you've probably heard of the gales of November, uh, this period where storms really start to tick upward in the Great Lakes region before ice starts to come. Um, so this is a lighthouse in Canal Park in Duluth. We're coming up on this period where it's pretty common to see uh, storms that roll down the western arm of Lake Superior. And um, it's pretty easy to see that there's a, a immense amount of energy in these waves crashing up um, on our community and really communities across the Great Lakes. And so using this environment to really understand, you know, how can we improve our observation and observations in this challenging environment and how might the Great Lakes play a role in developing sustainable energy, whether it's on the Great Lakes itself, or can we um, help this emerging industry that will ultimately deploy technologies around the world? I think we're uniquely positioned in Duluth, um, right on the shores of Lake Superior to really contribute to this industry. We also get crazy surfers. Um, I am not one of them, but we have a huge surfing community that loves these big storms. Um, you know, you get, we get meet, uh, two, three meter waves coming in this time of year and you'll start to see these, these crazy surfing communities. If you haven't seen the movie Freshwater, I highly recommend the documentary Freshwater. It's a tie between the surfing community up on Lake Superior and the science that goes on on the Great Lakes. Uh, which is led by a lot of faculty members through the Large Lakes Observatory. So um, check out the movie Freshwater if you get a chance. Of course, the surfing community loves these big storms, this wintertime environment, but it also causes a lot of damage to our communities. Year after year, even in just Duluth, uh, we're seeing these damaging storms and damaging flooding come into Canal Park millions of, of dollars um, just in the past five years or so have had to be put up towards repairing infrastructure um, on our lake walk and on our coast just in Duluth alone from these big storms. And so there's a lot of need and a lot of interest to better understand how these how this wave climate is changing in this environment, especially as we're seeing ice cover start to decrease um, on, on the Great Lakes. We see much less ice and those winter storms have a lot, much longer fetch across Lake Superior to build up these very damaging and powerful waves. So my interest kind of started around using uh, these data resources from these meteorological buoys that are all over the Great Lakes, NDBC, that's it's NOAA's National Data Buoy Center. Um, owns and operates buoys all around the world, um, all over our oceans and the Great Lakes. They provide a valuable resource going back 40, 50 years on what the wave climate and what the on-water meteor meteorological conditions were like. Um, we're starting to see inclusion of a lot of smaller observation systems um, scattered around the Great Lakes, but it's really a challenging environment to make these observations in and very sparse measurements all around um, each of the five Great Lakes. When we zoom in, if we, if we look at Lake Superior specifically, over the past 40 years, 99% of our observations from on Lake Superior come during this eight month period, really, you know, kind of a six or seven month period. We have very few observations from mid-November through kind of mid-April in this environment. It makes sense. It's incredibly challenging. We have to, you know, logistically, how do you keep things out on the water if there's drifting ice that might rip a, a buoy off of its mooring? Um, you can't get ships out there if the ports are, are frozen in. But we're seeing that environment start to change. And so we have this huge data gap for on-water observations um, over the past 40 years. And and my interest really started thinking about how can we perhaps use new systems to close in that data gap and start to get some um, winter season observations. On Friday this week, I'm going out on the Blue Heron with some others to go pull in the last of the big meteorological buoys for the season. So, you know, after Friday, we're not going to have any more observations out on Lake Superior, at least in our end of Lake Superior. And so it's, you know, we're getting into this period where we're seeing more and more large storms come through. 
but almost no observation systems out on the water. So in the, in the years since I've started at UMD, um, I've been there four years now, um, I've started engaging students in how do we develop new low cost buoys for this, this challenging marine environment. Um, this is a CAD rendering of the buoys that we're working on right now. It's about 10 inches in diameter, weighs 10 pounds, so very light. Uh, and we're trying to pack it full as, of as many sensors as possible, um, in part to develop a lower cost system. So those big NOAA buoys that I showed you, um, those can cost upwards of forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to build. It costs ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a day to take a ship out and deploy those buoys. Whereas these were targeting down around $1,000 um, to, to build these buoys and pack them full of sensors that it can, can measure the wave characteristics, um, measure near surface water and near surface air temperatures. Um, it has GPS tracking. So if we had these systems drifting around, we could use it to calculate drift current speeds. Uh, maybe we would have swarms of them thinking about, you know, can we use that information to help validate our uh, advancing numerical models that are being implemented in the Great Lakes region. Uh, these early systems that we're working on right now are including some water quality sensors, so pH, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, um, and really the goal behind all of this is, can we drive that cost down? Can we make a system that's small enough and light enough that we don't need big ship infrastructure to go out and deploy them? Uh, maybe we can use a fishing boat, or I could take a paddle board out and throw one of these in the water. Uh, maybe we could airdrop a swarm of these ahead of a big storm coming onto Lake Superior. And we're exploring different telemetry methods as well. So looking at some buoys have um, cell network connectivity. Uh, some of them have iridium satellites. So technically they could work all over the world. Um, and then we're using or implementing LoRa, which is uh, relatively, it, it, it's at least been emerging more recently. It's um, long range, wide area network. It's a unlicensed radio frequency for real time data communications. Um, and looking at how can we implement LoRa networks in this near shore marine environment um, and use, uh, have a higher density of these observation systems um, in this challenging marine environment. So I found, you know, this project has really turned into a computer science project. Um, how do you take accelerometers and measure, you know, 16 hertz over a 20 minute period and do all of the onboard post-processing of that information to have a very a relatively short bandwidth message being transmitted in real time, uh, conveying the wave statistics or conveying the position or the water quality observations from these buoy systems. Um, we're gearing up, uh, I have a project right now funded by the Department of Natural Resources from their Lake Superior Coastal Program. Um, we're gearing up, hoping to put the first of these buoys out just in a couple of weeks. Um, the, the, the goal behind this initial project is really to validate the measurements. Can we compare it against standard oceanographic um, systems to uh, validate the wave height measurements, validate the, the current drift speeds as it passes over what are called acoustic Doppler current profilers? And how does this relatively low cost system compare to these very expensive standard oceanographic equipment? And, really looking long-term of how can we use swarms of these low-cost buoys um, to better understand things like contaminant transport from the port of Duluth and Superior out, out towards the Apostle Islands. Um, how might we study other Lagrangian processes that are drifting around with the currents in Lake Superior? And really, can we utilize these systems during these more extreme storm events that we're seeing in the winter months? Um, specifically, what are some extreme wave heights that are occurring out there? I like to envision, you know, being from northern Minnesota, um, there's a lot of interest around the boundary waters, specifically a lot of mining interest right on the edge of the boundary waters. And I think as we navigate the challenges of the, that potential industry, 
uh, picking up in that region, I think it's important that we establish uh, baseline monitoring networks in this very valuable environment. And how can we do that in such a remote environment, but also have it be minimally visually intrusive? Um, you know, when people go to the boundary waters, they don't want to see electronics or see monitoring equipment. And so how can we implement small yet densely packed systems um, and maybe customize it to be a little more uh, camouflaged with, it, with its environment, yet still get this baseline real-time information from these very valuable um, remote locations that we have here in the state of Minnesota. And so thinking ahead of utilizing these systems to implement um, in these remote regions and what sort of real-time communications could be implemented for uh, those types of environments. So I mentioned LoRa, LoRa WAN, which is the long range wide area network. Um, I'm technically this semester, I'm working with Minnesota Sea Grant um, and we're exploring the possibility of implementing a new real time monitoring infrastructure along the entire Minnesota coastline of Lake Superior, basically from Duluth to uh, Grand Portage or the Canadian border. And looking at ways that maybe this newer LoRa infrastructure could benefit all types of communities and all types of research communities. Um, the idea behind this is, uh, I'll get into LoRa here in a little bit, but can we establish uh, these LoRa gateways? And what sort of role can this uh, low cost, low power monitoring network be or how can it how can it play a role for different sea grant or community initiatives, um, specifically things like fisheries and aquaculture? Can this industry that's really important to Minnesota, especially in things like the bait fish industry and uh, navigating the challenges with invasive species, how can we use Internet of Things, um, low cost, low power sensing networks to advance the fisheries and aquaculture industry here in Minnesota? Or how can we use it to improve uh, water safety or recreation activities along this region that so many people go and visit during the summer months? So with Sea Grant, we're exploring uh, the, the capabilities of LoRaWAN. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it it's, uh, kind of, it's a radio frequency uh, data telemetry method. It's, it's implemented I guess in, in other countries more widely at this point, but really it's focused on developing things like smart cities or smart utilities. Um, smart agriculture is another um, widely used LoRa uh, industry. And thinking about how can that be employed uh, closer to home to essentially make a smart environment along the North shore of Lake Superior. Um, LoRa has its benefits uh, compared to things like Wi-Fi or cell networks or Iridium satellite. Um, it's meant for low bandwidth, so we're not going to be sending a ton of data very frequently. You might think of sending uh, messages about your environment that you're monitoring every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes, um, but it's very low power. And so they, um, sensing networks can be powered off of small batteries for 10, 15 years without the need to go out and exchange batteries. Um, it has a relatively long transmission distance. So anywhere from 10 to 20 kilometers, depending on um, what type of environment you're in. And outside of the, the actual sensors or the, the main central gateway, there are no data transmission fees. So like we don't have to pay a cell, a monthly cell bill um, or we don't have to pay Iridium satellite bills if we're, if we're sending messages from very remote regions in the world. So it, it has some benefits and fills in this kind of long range, but lower bandwidth data telemetry um, in the world of sensing. The, the general architecture that we're looking at is we'll have our our sensors out in the field, you might be monitoring you know, water quality at a position. 
Uh, maybe you're monitoring some air quality condition. It can be used for energy monitoring and for transportation in small cities. Really, there's, there's open opportunities for what we can sense. Um, it can have tens or hundreds of sensors within a radius of a central gateway, which is the connection point between those sensors and the end application. So it allows users to see in real time um, you know, what, what is being sensed in the environment that you're, you're focusing on. Um, you know, the, the gist of LoRa, it, really the, the opportunities for it, we think are, are relatively limitless. Um, we can think about all sorts of environmental monitoring, energy monitoring. Um, there's ideas about, can we use it to implement smart road salt application in Duluth or communities on the North shore that are really focusing on how do we minimize that salt contaminants from running into Lake Superior? You know, very, a very um, folk, uh, strong focal point here in the Twin Cities as well. How do we minimize the contamination from road salts in the urban waterways around the Twin Cities? Here in the Twin Cities, you have very easy access to Wi-Fi networks. Um, but along the North Shore, we start to see pretty spotty cell reception and very limited um, Wi-Fi accessibility along the North Shore, which provides a very strong opportunity to implement these low raw networks. Um, and kind of the case study that we're uh, building off of is something that was just rolled out in Lake Erie called the Smart Lake Erie Watershed. Last year in 2022, around August of 2022, they rolled out the implementation of the LoRa network. Um, it covers the entire Ohio coastline of Lake Erie. And they've positioned those central gateways at strategic locations up on radio towers or water towers in communities along the shoreline of Ohio or of Lake Erie in Ohio, which provides this continuous coverage um, you know, out onto the water for 20, 30 kilometers, and even inland where researchers and communities can position hundreds of sensors if, if desired to really improve their smart monitoring of their environment or their stormwater infrastructure. Um, and so our idea is to look at what are the potential applications here on the North shore of Minnesota um, that we can mimic something like this low run network that has been rolled out in Lake Erie. Um, so initially, we've been starting by just kind of simulating radio coverage from these central gateways and trying to understand you know, what is this range of connectivity that we could ha have if we had sensors out in the environment. And it, it's looking really promising. Um, you know, even out onto open water, we're seeing potential data transmission distances of 30 to 50 kilometers all the way across to the Apostle Islands where we could potentially have networks of sensors that are communicating in real time back to these central gateways um, in communities along the North Shore and thinking about what existing infrastructure we can utilize on this in this North Shore environment, water towers or existing um, um, radio towers where we could mount these gateways and get even better coverage. One thing that we deal with on the North shore of Minnesota that that Lake Erie example avoids is we have very sharp topography going from the water. You know, if you've ever been up to Lutzen, um, there's six, 700 feet of vertical change in a very short distance. And so that pro proves challenging for this low run network um, in this environment where we can't get quite as far a coverage looking inland compared to out over the water. So it's a system, it's a potential um, observation network that really could benefit this near shore environment in the Lake Superior, um, in the near shore Lake Superior marine environment. Uh, one, one example of what this kind of looks like close to home where we've, we've set up one of those central gateways on the UMD campus and out in the St. Louis estuary in Duluth, you know, it's, it's, not that groundbreaking at this point, but it's it's proving the concept of how we can have different sensors out and freely transmitting real-time information and look at things like what is SASH activity on the on Lake Superior and how can we 
integrate these low cost, low power sensors um, and test the range of connectivity in these urban environments like Duluth and the St. Louis estuary onwards up towards the Canadian border across um, um, in Minnesota on the shore of Lake Superior. And really, I think this, this, this idea behind creating a smart environment has applications all around Minnesota. Um, you know, we know we're the land of lakes. And if you go in and look around the state of Minnesota and look at potential coverage around all of these marine environments, um, imagine putting one of these central LoRa gateways at a cabin or at a resort in northern Minnesota and the type of sensing that could happen within the coverage zone of these central low, low raw gateways. And how can we advance these relatively rural or remote regions of Minnesota to improve our smart monitoring of this environment, whether it's the, the marine environment or um, studying air quality or other phenomena out in our environment. It removes the burden of having people go out and to do manual sampling, which is uh, the Minnesota DNR has a lot of uh, manual sampling programs still. Um, and it really thinks about ways that we can move our, in or our state into this internet of things, low cost technology and, and smart environment. So kind of returning back to this idea behind uh, the challenges associated with Lake Superior, um, close to home in Duluth. You know, we're coming up on the winter season. Um, this is from April of this year. So just you know, at the end of the winter season, the lighthouse in Canal Park. Um, I think it, you know, it's pretty easy to see some of the challenges that we face when thinking about making observations in this environment. Some of those ice blocks you see are of the size of a small car you know, being tossed around in these 10 foot waves coming in through the, the entrance to our, our port. This is early on in the storm this day. There were about 10 foot waves. Later that night out in the open water, the waves got upwards of 20, 25 feet. So really, really impressive waves and really impressive amounts of energy on Lake Superior. It, it really behaves like an ocean, but we have this added challenge of dealing with drifting ice and, and dealing with these incredibly um, destructive forces. So as you saw at the beginning, you know, my, my other core area of interest is in the field of marine renewable energy. And you know, seeing this environment close to home, it's pretty easy to see that there's a, a, a tremendous amount of energy available in those waves. So if you haven't heard of marine renewable energy, uh, just a quick introduction, you know, there's it's the idea behind how do we harness energy from tides or ocean currents or the waves along our coastlines? Um, and how do we convert that into usable mechanical or electrical energy? There's a tremendous amount of, of available power just on the coastlines or in the rivers here in the US. Um, I see this map, you know, the, the Department of Energy has a strong interest in pursuing this in emerging industry. And I see this number of 2,300 terawatt hours and admittedly most people don't really understand what that means and so if we focus in on that number you know according to what the average U.S. household uses per year the technical amount of power in our marine resource could power about 216 million homes in the U.S. if we could figure out how to cap harness that energy from waves and tides we could power about 216 million homes. There's only 140 million homes in the US. And so technically we could power every single home from our marine resource. Now the residential sector is a very small energy consuming sector across the US, but I think it's easy to see that, you know, if we figure out technologies that can safely operate in this environment, we have a potential to contribute huge amounts of energy to our energy infrastructure.
this industry has really, you know, five or 10 years ago, they were focused on grid integration of wave energy or tidal energy, but it's moved into what is called the Powering the Blue Economy Initiative. And this might be where there's, you see also some additional overlaps into some of the projects that you study. Uh, the idea is how can we integrate um, marine energy technologies, maybe a wave energy converter, for example, into remote observation systems? Can we add new sensors or have more power hungry sensors, maybe sample more quickly or send data more frequently? If we can design systems for remote marine operations that can have on-site power through a wave energy converter, for example. There are all these different blue economic industries, things like remote docking stations for underwater vehicles, um, gliders, for example. Can we provide on-site power for aquaculture industries or operate desalination equipment to produce fresh water in communities that really need it? And so this industry is transitioning away from grid integrations to power homes and industries and thinking about how can we power or create power on-site from waves or from tidal currents to develop systems to improve our understanding of marine environments or power remote communities and decrease their reliance on diesel power or batteries um, to power these observation systems. So just a, a look closer to home. Um, I have a small buoy, a small wave buoy at Park Point Beach, if you've ever been to Duluth. Uh, measures waves and water conditions. I, I looked before coming down here, the water is currently 49 degrees, so still pretty warm. Uh, you could go for a swim briefly in that. Uh, but we're getting into this wavy season. And so we can go into that buoy and, and understand what the real-time wave and water conditions are like. Uh, about three and a half weeks ago, or mid-October, we had you know, the first of our seasonal storms coming through. Not all that big of waves, but you know, a start to look at how much power is available in these waves near Duluth and on Lake Superior. Um, it was a about a two to three day event. So from October 12th through the 15th, uh, the waves picked up on a Thursday afternoon and rolled in through Friday night. On Friday night, three and a half weeks ago, there were waves kind of in the two meter range, not all that big. Um, the largest wave on Lake Superior ever observed was 29 feet in 2017. So you know, these are small compared to a, a 29 foot wave. If you're standing on shore, a wave would be passing by every five to six seconds during this storm, so a wave period of five to six seconds. And we can use those parameters measured by these wave buoys to think of or to calculate how much wave power there actually is in those waves. So we, we quantify that in terms of watts per meter crest. So if you had a you know a linear meter of a wave crest coming towards you, how many watts are in those waves? So during the height of that storm three and a half weeks ago, we were upwards of maybe 15, 16 kilowatts, just in a meter width of that wave. So we can integrate under that curve, under that two to the three day storm event to understand how much total energy was available in that single storm in Duluth, about 330 kilowatt hours per meter. Now that's it's it's kind of hard to wrap your head around what does that actually mean. Um, so I always like to put that in terms of like reach your arms out. I'm six feet tall, so my arm spans about six feet. If we think about that storm, at 334 kilowatt hours per meter, just across the width of my arms during that storm event, there was just over 600 kilowatt hours of potential energy that I could have harnessed. That's enough for about 21 homes for a day, just in the width of my arm. So an intense amount of power. Um, current technologies can harness about 20 to 40% of that. So maybe four to eight homes, really. If we, if I had a wave energy converter, the, the diameter of my arms harnessing that available energy. 
So we're taking that information and using about 15 years of hindcast mo numerical model data from all over the Great Lakes and piecing together this story of what the wave climate is like and what the wave power availability is like um, on these five Great Lakes to understand how can this climate be used in developing this emerging industry. Um, you know, you come up in the summertime, you probably saw a pretty flat, calm Lake Superior. That's true all across the Great Lakes, great, great calm summer period. But it's when we get into these winter months, November, December, uh, that we start to see some intense increases in wave power availability across the Great Lakes. It's very similar to the U.S. coastline. Low power in the summer, very large power available in the winter months. Um, and because of where our storms are coming from in the Great Lakes region, oftentimes that power is really clustered over towards the eastern ends of, of the lakes. That largest wave of 29 feet on Lake Superior was kind of measured over in this uh, brightest yellow region a few years ago, so on the eastern side of the lakes. So we are, if you, you know, if I go back to that map of wave power or of marine power potential in the U.S., there's a big void in the Great Lakes. And so the Department of Energy is interested in filling in that void and understanding how this Great Lakes environment can contribute to this emerging industry. Uh, we can look more closely as, you know, month by month as seasons change, how that wave power variability is changing. Um, at different locations on each of the Great Lakes? And where might it be optimal to test wave energy converters in this challenging environment? Um, really, the, 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 conditions, the conditions change so frequently on Lake Superior, largely because of where storms are coming from and what sort of fetch or distance those waves are traveling across to get to a certain point. But what I think we're realizing is that this environment in Lake Superior really has strong potential to tie into one of those blue economic um, industries for the marine um, energy industry. Specifically, how can we look at providing on-site power for different observation systems in this marine environment? Can we have remotely operated um, buoy LIDAR that are measuring atmospheric properties out in the middle of Lake Superior and avoid the need to have a huge battery bank to power that system. Um, can we recharge some of the onboard batteries through a wave energy converter, for example? Can we provide on-site power for things like um, acoustic sensors in the oceans to monitor marine life? or other types of marine observation systems, whether you're focusing on air-sea interactions or processes happening deep in the ocean. Um, so thinking about things like, can we increase the length of our sensor deployments or maybe add more sensors or how fast those sensors are sampling? Uh, can we use new forms of data telemetry to improve the communications of that data that's being um, being collected out in these remote environments, really looking at how these power hungry operations can be supplemented by marine energy technologies. Of course, the Great Lakes environment provides these challenges of how do we deal with ice? Um, you know, what's, how are they gonna interact with the freshwater ecosystems and what challenges might that present? But one of my big interests in observations and marine energy on Lake Superior is that, you know, coming up on winter time, we're gonna have environments that look just like this, this, this beautiful pancake ice um, close to home in Duluth and dealing with waves as they propagate through these floating ice environments. And as we look farther north to our polar regions, to the Arctic, we're seeing less and less summer ice extent and there's a lot of interest in how do we open up that area for shipping lanes or resource extraction? And what are the challenges that are coming along with that? How do we add more observation systems for that environment? And how do we power those observation systems in this challenging Arctic environment? And really the Great Lakes environment on Lake Superior is very similar 
to that summertime Arctic sea ice environment where we see waves of four to five meters in the Arctic. We see that same condition with floating ice on Lake Superior in the winter. And so can we utilize this Lake Superior environment to test technologies that ultimately are gonna be deployed in this polar or this Arctic region that might have to deal with drifting ice patterns? So we're also looking at things like what sort of currents are in Lake Superior? Um, Lake Superior doesn't have a tide, but it has a seiche. So picture a sloshing bathtub going back and forth. Every eight hours, there's this sloshing of water from one end of Lake Superior to the other end of Lake Superior. And we've got sensors in the canal in Duluth by the lift bridge, and you can see that eight hour oscillation of currents changing direction through that canal. And so we can go in and calculate using the velocities and imagine having a current energy converter mounted to the wall of that canal and think about what, how much power could we actually generate from those oscillating seiche currents close to home in Duluth. So I hope you, I hope this gave you a flavor of some of the work uh, that I'm involved with and trying to get students involved with up at UMD, your neighbors to the north. Um, Really, I think it's it's we have such a unique field lab in Lake Superior and utilizing the blue heron um, to engage in these challenging marine environments and and deploy sensors out in this marine environment. Um, I I was talking with Tim earlier. I, I didn't go into details about some of the other um, anemometry work that I have ongoing at UMD, but I think there's real opportunities to think about you know how can we in uh, instrument some of these towers in Duluth on the shore of Lake Superior to look at things like marine atmospheric boundary layer processes. And um, how can we kind of build our understanding of how this wave climate and how this, this challenging environment is changing as we start to see um, decreasing ice cover in our winter months. So with that, thank you. And uh, I'll take any questions if you have them. How do you harness energy from waves? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of waves all over the world. But yeah, is anybody doing it right? Now? Yeah, there are there are lots of companies pursuing it. Um, you know, we the it's such a new industry that the they haven't converged on one technology. So there are things that are called point absorbers, essentially a buoy that is bobbing up and down that might have a linear generator inside of it, or might somehow be converting that vertical motion into a rotary generator. Um, there are things called oscillating wave surge converters, which are like big paddles that rock back and forth with the surging motion of every wave that's driving either hydraulic generators or rotary generators and transmitting that power to shore. Um, so many different designs, both in wave energy conversion and current energy conversion right now. Is it being done on a commercial basis yet, or is it still? The, I guess they would all still be considered full-scale um, kind of one-off prototype testing. Uh, there are companies, for example, uh, Asila Power, in Seattle is has a big point absorber that's deployed in Hawaii right now. Um, Verdant Power in New York City in the East River, which is actually a tidal channel, has an array of um, tidal energy converters operating. Um, there are several, you know, ORPC is a company out of Maine that is deploying turbines in Alaska and Canada and um, about to deploy some in the lower Mississippi River. Um, and really, we're lagging behind the European industry. So there's lots of devices in the water in Europe right now. Would you, would you ever extract nothing? Like if you had an array of this type of design generator set up offshore somewhere, mm -hmm. would, it, would you ever extract enough energy to like change the, the properties of that ecosystem? Or is that not even close to being It's it's possible. Um, some of the biggest critics actually of wave energy converters are the surfing community. Uh, you take energy out of the waves, there's 
less waves to surf on, but concerns of, especially um, in areas where there's a lot of active sediment transport. You know, do you take away that energy that is responsible for the sediment transport and the um, biological activity in that um, sediment interface? You know, how really at this stage, it's all numerical modeling and you have to have very large arrays um, to even approach any negative impacts like that. I think the biggest concerns with this industry are focused on marine life interactions. You know, is it going to hit a whale or hit a seal or the electromagnetic interference from transmitting that electricity? And how does, how do the sounds or how does that EMI impact biological communications or biological activity? Um, what were your like guiding principles that you followed in selecting what sensors you going to put into your view? Um, the it all started around you know my background was in marine energy. It all started around how can we measure waves when we don't have wave observation systems out there. We're using essentially a ten dollar motion sensor, whereas Typical wave sensors cost about ten thousand uh, dollars. So how can we drive down the cost of that and have more expansive wave observations? But you can go out and buy a GPS buoy or a wave buoy for maybe ten thousand dollars right now, very easily. And so I wanted to make it something that was much lower cost than that, and try to make it open source so it would be eventually accessible to other research groups. Um, I wanted it to be something that maybe like lake associations would want to use in Minnesota. Can we monitor water quality on our lakes in real time? Um, can we, you know, can we add these water quality sensors to enhance the monitoring programs by the DNR or other state agencies? So, yeah. I just want to follow up on that, Craig. What is your, um, you go with low cost sensors, what's your sort of performance, what would you expect as low, you know, lower performance or uncertainty? Well, we're, this DNR project that we're getting into is all focused on the validation against kind of standard oceanographic sensors. Um, and I don't know that I've come up with a threshold yet for like, what is the uncertainty quantification for each specific sensor to consider it viable for the system? But yeah, that's you know that's definitely something that needs to be considered. So the buoys that you're putting in, I mean, you're still going to get ice, and I assume that these expensive buoys are taken out because they don't want to be damaged. Sure. Yep. Are these smaller ones not going to be damaged, or what's going to happen? They, uh, the at least now the thinking is that if they do get damaged it's not gonna break the project budget. And kind of the future of this development is one thing I'd like to look at is what sort of materials can we use to develop enclosures that might let it withstand ice. Um, you know, there's, I would love to have one get frozen into the ice and maybe the batteries die, but does it come back to life in April when it breaks free? Um, can we, you know, can we, if if the western arm of Lake Superior does get iced in this winter, can we go airdrop some out just into open water, um, beyond the edge of ice, and see what happens with them? I don't. It's it's a big unknown at this point. Anything online? I was going to ask because you have a phase changing thing, so you're the communication. I think with LoRa, yes, you can. You can have, yeah, you can. I don't know the specifics of it, but I, you can have kind of like repeater nodes. Okay, thank you, Craig. Yeah, thanks, everyone.